Uh, I, I work with developers or with companies that, that produce software. That means either they want to do software for, for, their, for their own you know, in, in internal uh, systems or they are doing software to sell the software. And um, so I'm, I'm focusing very much on software security. And for the last, I guess, three, four years, it, it's all around um, this field I call identity and access control. So, uh, you know, when you try to sell security to companies, it's more like, um, you know, something they have to do, whereas identity and access control is a feature. Okay, so that's much, much easier. Now, for the last years, um, I guess, um, you know, when it came to authentication, authorization, all these, um, these uh, problems, um, there were these big specifications, yeah, like W is star, W is federation, W is security, um, W is trust, and they were driven by the, by, the, by the enterprises, basically. Now, this era is over. If you haven't realized yet, it's over. W is trust, W is federation, W is uh, security. These are all like cons considered dinosaurs in the, in the security world because there's one, one big, big driver in the industry which is changing everything, and that's mobile computing. Okay? So if you want to incorporate any sort of mobile experiences, let's put it this way, in your software, and that can be even a laptop yeah, that is uh, roaming, yeah? it, it doesn't need to be specifically like a, a smartphone or a tablet, then you need to talk protocols that are, you know, that are, that are working on these devices. And there is no WS Trust spec on iOS, there is no WS Trust spec on Android, there is no WS Trust spec on Windows 8 even. So that means we have to adapt. If we want to play in the mobile market, we can't use these old, old 10-year-old specifications anymore. We have to use the new hip stuff that the hipsters do. Yeah? The guys um, that sit in, in uh, Starbucks with their Macintosh and, and writing apps. Yeah? And the replacement for many of the problems that WS Trust and, and friends uh, try to solve is called OAuth. OAuth for open authorization. And you know, all the big guys are doing it, like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter. They, they, they started using that, that, that stuff. And interesting, interestingly, for the first time, it seems like that specs that came from the web slash consumer space trickle down in the enterprise and not vice versa. And that's an interesting observation. And since the protocol is so new and lot of, lots of things have gone wrong just recently, which is perfect for my talk, um, I thought it might be worthwhile to A, show you how it works, but because I just assumed that not everybody here is an O of expert in the room, and B, um, the problems that um, um, some found, I found myself while implementing it, and others found the hard way. So my name is Dominic. I used to work at EANW a long time ago. Well, not so long time ago, like eight, eight, years. eight years. So where I focused a lot on breaking stuff. Now I focus a lot on fixing stuff or making it uh, you know, a little bit harder, at least. Um, so I guess the most important thing here is really my email address. So if you have any questions after the talk, feel free to write me an email. The agenda is simple. As I said, I want to give you an overview of what OAuth is and some you know, concerns. And it's actually a very controversial protocol, actually, yeah? um, which makes it much, much more fun to talk about. So what is OAuth? Yeah, so the first thing is it's an authorization protocol. That's the most, the biggest misconception because people still don't know what's the difference between authentication and authorization. So many people use it for authentication, which is not the protocol's intent, and we'll see later on how wrong that is. Um, but it says it's an open protocol for secure authorization in a simple and standard method for web, mobile, and desktop applications. And if you follow this little link here, read the OAuth 2 specification, brings you to the RFC, which has to be in Korea, obviously, yeah, um, to make it more you know, substantial. And you can see it's actually an RFC, uh, a pretty new one from October last year. So basically, they're saying the same thing, just in more words. Now, what's the history of, of the protocol? It, um, it's interesting. It started as a pure consumer thing. It was written by one single guy, um, or started by a single guy called Aaron Hammer. Uh, which I'll talk about later in more detail. And uh, it bas basically was um, kind of um, um, solving very, very early problems, like how Google 
controls access to its resources like, um, like calendar and mail and um, contacts and things like that. And um, once uh, it got more traction, um, they submitted it to the IETF. And I guess that's the thing that Aaron will regret for the rest of his life, that he started a formal um, standardization process using the IETF. So RFC 5849 defines OAuth 1.0 in 2010. Then suddenly all the other big companies became, you know, interested, like Microsoft came in and Yahoo and uh, Google again and, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all, all the, the larger companies which all had, had enterprise interests as well and, you know, started doing their, their own little thing here. Um, and t in 2010, the work on OAuth 2.0 began because all of these companies thought that OAuth 1.0 was too complicated. So we have, we, have to, we have to simplify this, yeah, to make it easier for our developers. And sometimes things might be too simple, even. So the interesting thing is now, between 2010 and 2012, there were like, I think, 32 revisions of the, of the, of the draft. And in between these 32, uh, 32 uh, revisions, all the big guys decided to implement it you know, at some point in the revision uh, process, like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, GitHub, Twitter, Flickr, Dropbox, and so on. And this risk, list reads very much like the, 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 the list of all the companies that have been hacked recently, yeah? Um, so, and the interesting thing, which makes this really fun to talk about, is um, just like three months before the finalization of the protocol, the lead author said, I'm done with it. OAuth sucks. Yeah, <laughs> OAuth is a piece of shit, basically was his, was his wording. <laughs> and he removed his name from all the documents. So he said like, I, I don't want to be associated with this protocol anymore, okay? Um, and so Microsoft hired a guy, actually. Um, some may know him, Dick Hart. He, he did this famous um, I, um, Identity 2.0 talk, maybe someone remembers that. Um, from OSCON, uh, he hired, they hired an, an external guy that like, can you please write that last revision so we can finally sign off this thing and get it out of the streets, yeah? And that's what happened in October. Um, we have these two specs now, and I will talk about now what they're actually doing. So, a high-level overview, um, OAuth is trying to achieve something really simple. So we have a user that is trying to access data or a service, yeah? And maybe you've seen in the uh, intro, it's about HTTP-based services, so it's all about, you know, REST, RESTful services, HTTP, web APIs, you know, the thing that, you know, the, the cool kids do these days. Um, but for the first time, actually, um, they, they, they took something into consideration. It's not actually the human directly accessing a service, it's a human accessing data via an application, okay? And the application might or might not be fully trusted. And even more common maybe, maybe you trust the application, but maybe your company doesn't trust the device the application is running on, okay? So the first time you're reading the spec, your head will hurt because they use different terminology here. So they have this thing called the client. And the first time I read it, it uh, it didn't make any sense to me because the client in my mind was this guy, but the client is the application in their speech. And this guy is the resource owner, and the resource owner owns a resource on the resource server. And the client acts on behalf of the resource owner to access that resource. There's a fun an analogy um, from the real world. So who knows this movie? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> Ferris macht blau, yeah? So, the, the story behind that is, you, maybe for those who don't know it, or for those who can't remember, they're basically they're taking a day off from school and uh, stealing daddy's car, okay? So, so they, they, they have this really, really uh, expensive Ferrari, and they, they wanna have, have a day off and, and bring it to um, valet parking. Do you know what, what valet parking is in the States? Basically, you, you have to drive somewhere, give some guy a key, and he parks the car for you. And you know, they're kind of concerned, like can we really you know, trust this guy giving me the key to this very expensive car? But he said, no problem, trust me. <laughs> yeah? So, so the next scene was basically that this guy and his friend yeah, <laughs> took a road trip. <laughs> and coming back to OAuth, that is exactly what they're trying to solve. 
so basically, the, the resource they were owning was the car, okay? And they were giving a client, a third party, access to that resource. Now, what, what, what did they give them? They gave them the key, your master key to, to the resource. And is that something that you like to give other people, your master key to some other resource? Probably not, yeah? So in the States, actually, there are things called valet parking keys. So when you buy a car, you get two sets of keys. One is the master key, one is the valet parking key. And with the valet parking key, you can only drive the car for five miles. You don't have access to the, to the trunk, and you can't use the built-in mobile phone. Okay? So what this protocol is trying to solve is how would a valet parking key for the internet work? How can we give a, a third-party client that we partially trust, maybe, only limited access to a resource that we own. Perception. Pardon? Maybe just for, for a certain amount of time. Maybe even that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe even you want to revoke that access at some point when, when you think it's, it's the right place, to, uh, the right point in time to, re to revoke it. And that's exactly what this problem is trying to solve, okay? OAuth is exactly about this problem. So let's have a closer look at what um, we have here. So we already talked about the resource owner. That's the guy that's owning a resource. Think of the Ferrari. We have the resource server. Well, that's not really directly applicable. We have the client. And the thing that OAuth adds to the mix is a so-called authorization server. That's the thing that basically gives out limited access keys. OK? So basically, the idea is this. The resource owner owns a resource. The resource server trusts the authorization server that um, the keys that it's giving out are you know, trustworthy or can be used. Then we have the, the client that is used by the resource owner to access the resource. The client is typically registered with the authorization server and authorized by the authorization server and access the resource on behalf of the resource owner. Okay? Think of Twitter. Yeah, Twitter has a backend. You have a Twitter account. There are, there's only one application, one Twitter client made by Twitter called TweetDeck. All the others are third parties. Okay? And you never give them your Twitter password. They, only have, they, they, they do a certain handshake, and, and I'll show it later how it works, to, give, uh, to, to get access to your data. So what are the trust relationships here? Basically, this is a trust zone. Resource server and authorization server belong together, okay? The authorization server is an intimate part of the resource server. It knows about the resources that the resource server is trying to protect. Um, the resource owner has a trust with the resource server, obviously, because it has resources on that server. And you see, by default, the, the client is, is outside of the trust zone. It, it's not trusted, okay? So they actually have three types or four types of clients. One is called a confidential client, which is uh, basically a client that can keep a secret, typically something that is installed on the server, like a web application is a server-based server client. A public client would be something that is on your, on your machine, something that's on your machine can't keep a secret. Yeah? For example, yeah, they can't keep a secret, you just need a debugger. Yeah? Um, trusted clients are basically clients that you don't trust per se, you don't want to give them your master key, uh, sorry, untrusted clients and trusted clients are the ones that you trust. Or again, um, I guess, where the device that they are installed on is considered trusted. Yeah? So maybe you're having a really tightly controlled device from your company, you know, full hard disk encryption, whatever, remote wiping, stuff like that. Maybe you, then, you, then it's okay for you to store a password on that device. Otherwise, maybe you don't. So it can be trusted, but that's a special case in OAuth. Okay? Okay, cool. So, OAuth defines five flows. Basically flows how to request access, request a token, and path forward a token to the, to the application you're using. Um, there are two flows which, which um, require user interaction and three flows which, which don't. So I will focus on the three most common ones. Um, there are other ones for, you know, like embedded hardware, like set-top boxes and stuff like that, which we don't cover here. So the, the most, no, well, a very common one is, the call, is called the authorization code flow. And that is for web applications. So you're, the client that you're giving access to your resource is a web application, something that is running on a <coughs> server, okay? 
And you can see there's, um, there are basically three steps here, request authorization, request the token, access the resource. That is the typical flow here. Then there's something called the implicit flow, which is for locally installed applications, something running on your hardware. And they conflate the authorization and token stage. And actually, that is the one that is mostly discussed these days, if it really doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah? And there's the one called the resource owner password credential flow, which is for trusted applications where there is no authorization stage. That could be like your, your trusted piece of software on your highly secured corporate hardware, for example. Yeah? And also, um, a not so nice uh, way of uh, describing that, but you'll see it in literature, is basically they call that the free legged OAuth and the two legged OAuth. Yeah? Because here we have three, three steps, here we have two steps, here we actually have also three steps, but as I said, they, they conflated um, two steps into one, which is a problem, actually. Okay. So let's start with the, the web application client or the authorization code flow. That's the idea. You are sitting in front of a browser. Um, you're going to a web, web application, and that web application should work on your behalf on some data. Yeah? Think of a Twitter client that, that is running in the browser yeah? and accessing data on your behalf on Twitter. Or think of an application that's accessing your, your protected Flickr pictures on your behalf to print them, stuff like that. Uh, and you can easily move that into the, in the corporate space. Think of an application that accesses your corporate calendar, stuff like that. Yeah? So we don't want to give that web application our master key for the resource server, our password, right? OK, so how can we do that? So um, it's all done by the magic of HTTP redirects. <laughs> Um, so, so the idea is this, the web application redirects the browser to the authorization server. That's the guy that can authenticate the resource owner and knows about the application that's trying to access the data. Okay? So you can see basically we have a, um, uh, um, a, qu a query string here saying, hey, I'm a web app. This, this is the application. It needs to register beforehand with the authorization server. They exchange um, you know, a, a secret basically. Um, they say, I want to access that resource here. And when you are done with the authorization process, come back to this address here and, and give me a so-called code. That's, that's the thing I want to have back. And this here is quite in interesting, which is skipped in some uh, implementations. That's, that's basically a random number that the client has to come up with, send it to the server, and the server has to send it back. Why? Cross-site request forgery. Okay, we, we want to make sure that, that, that the request coming back from the server is actually matching the request that we sent to the server. Obviously, that means that the client has to store state, which many don't. And then what you'll see basically here is um, what we call the consent dialog. So basically, there's a dialog saying, listen, there's the application. In, in that case, the application is called dot, 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 and it wants access to your Google Reader data, which is you know, soon obsolete because Google Reader is shut down by the 1st of July if you haven't heard the news today, which sucks. Yeah? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so basically what you're saying is, okay, I allow this application access to my Google Reader data. And if you're pressing OK, then exactly that will happen. Okay? And that's what people often don't get. Like, I, I recently got a, got a question from a guy saying, like, yeah, but can this save my grandma on the internet? And I said, well, actually, your grandma, nothing can save your grandma on the internet, yeah? Not an, an OAuth can't either. Okay? If you press OK here, you are in the game. For example, this here is a nice uh, photoshopped Twitter consent screen. Would you, would you say uh, allow here? <laughs> it takes some time to read it, right? <laughs> yeah? So, as I said, whatever you click here, yes, you are, you are uh, responsible for that, yeah? Okay, so when you click uh, allow, then basically we, we go back to the callback that was um, specified by, by the response, uh, by, by, by the request. And by the way, that's again another implementation flaw that um, servers don't validate the callback URI and some, some, suddenly it goes back somewhere else and they didn't know that. Yeah? Um, they send you back a code and they, they send you back the state. And again, this state has to be validated with, with the state that we recorded before we made the request. Otherwise, you know, they, they might not match. Okay? And then with that, with that code, you go back to uh, the application, goes back to the authorization server, 
has to authenticate with the authorization server, with the secret that they exchanged um, uh, a priori, say, and here's my code, and get back an access token. Okay? This is JSON. It's all JSON now because it, it has to be JavaScript friendly. Yeah? Um, so the access token basically gives you access to the resource, uh, expires in, basically says, okay, how long is this thing uh, valid? Token type, we'll talk about it later. And there's a thing called a refresh token, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay? And with that access token in hand, the application can from now on access exactly the resource that I consented to. Okay? So basically, after that, they can access the resource on my behalf without me being, you know, having to be in front of the computer anymore. Okay? So, JSON Web Tokens, that's the new, the, the new token format that they, 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 they're using here. And it's basically a, a JSON encoded string. So we can basically say JavaScript, you know, uh, JSON stringify uh, and, and get, get, get a JavaScript object. Uh, it's also easy, easy to pass in other languages. But the idea is basically we have a header um, which says I'm a JSON Web Token or JOT, as they say. Um, algorithm, which uh, defines the hashing algorithm here. And then we have a list of cl so-called claims. Yeah? Um, so some of them are reserved claim names, like issuer, expiration, audience. Some are, you know, something that you can freely um, define, like name, role, whatever. Yeah? So basically what, how, that, how that works is they take the header, base64 encoded, dot, take the claims, base64 encoded, dot, and do, this, uh, do a signature over the first part and append a signature to that. And, and that's, that's what, what you send around, around basically. basically. Which, Which is fine, fine. Yeah. you know? And, and then, then there's this thing called the refresh, refresh token, token here. here. And, and that, that is basically um, giving the client an opportunity to renew his token once the original token has expired. Okay? So, so let's say um, you, you want to give this, um, this application long-lived access to the, to the resource. And maybe they're doing something on behalf in the background, yeah? Like, um, there are services, for example, that, that give you, like, an, an info, like, this week uh, you had six new followers and four left, and you had so, so many retweets. Uh, retweets. And that's uh, how they do that is by running batch jobs in the background, and they need access to that for, for a longer period of time. And again, if you consent to give out refresh tokens, then that's what you do. And maybe you've seen these pages here before um, where you can actually revoke refresh tokens. So here, for example, I gave uh, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom access to my Flickr album. And if at some point I realize I don't want that anymore, I can revoke it. And what they te uh, technically do is they revoke the refresh token. So we can't refresh our existing token. OK. Or that's the same thing at Dropbox. Yeah? Maybe you've, you've seen that before. Um, that's how you can connect applications to Dropbox without giving them your Dropbox password. Obviously, that, that's the whole idea here. Questions? Yeah? That is um, basically um, this stage here, yeah? When you refresh the token, or also on first use, maybe, yeah? Um, you see that what the authorization, authorization server should do is, is note down, write down for which client was that token. And the, cl the client has to re-authenticate when he's refreshing the token. So that's how you can bind the token to a certain client, if it's implemented, okay? And that is one of the things that doesn't happen all the time. So the, the Twitter hack, for example, uh, Twitter was hacked like some months ago. What they stole were refresh tokens. And it turned out there was no client binding. <laughs> yeah? So that they had, had to reset all the accounts. OK. Let's go through the uh, so-called implicit flow. That's the, the most interesting one, actually, from a security point of view. Um, it's for native or for client applications. As we all know, these are, these are the ones which can't be secured by definition. Yeah? But the idea is simple. You have, a, you have a resource owner. 
he has some sort of device and the software is running on the device. Now again, what OAuth dictates is there must be user interaction. Okay, so we can't just silently request a token for the, for the resource, that the user must give consent. Okay, and how do we give consent in a native application? What do we have to do? Which ugly thing that you all seen before? Technically speaking, a web view. You have to open a browser. You have to open something that renders a web page. Okay? Something like this, yeah? Which looks like a native uh, window and is supposed to render Google. <laughs> right? So, yeah. You basically type in your password in this dialog here and you click again, I allow access for application XY to access my data in the web view, then they close the web view. They're, they're, they're typically, the way this works is, uh, depends on the operating system, I, I will talk about it later, but the client gets back a token via the browser directly without having the code in between. As you can see here, we are requesting a token. Again, we have to do the, the whole cross-site request forgery thing. Um, yeah, and what we get back is the token directly on the callback access token or on, on the query string. Okay, this time they, they, they use a hash fragment and not a, a question mark, which is different in HTTP because hash fragments are not, are not locked by servers and don't appear in referrer headers. When you click another link, they, they wouldn't, you know, which would be a problem um, if they would be in the referrer header and they would trace that, um, stuff like that. But that's basically the, the simplified version for local, locally installed applications. Okay. And let's defer the discussion, if that is, makes sense at all, <laughs> to later. But that's how it works. Yeah? And I'm, oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've seen that before. Let, let's do this. Um, I just installed the, the, the new Twitter client for Windows 8 this morning. So when I click here, what they're now doing is they're opening a web view inside, oh, I'm not, I'm not online. That's an issue. Um, how do I get online here? True pass this one? Right. Oop. Great P, capital P, R, double O, P, three, R, S, one, three. Okay. Let's try again. You see that? Who has seen this before, this dialogue? Yeah, some of you. So basically, basically what, what they're rendering here is a web page, okay? Uh, and that's, by the way, Windows 8. They, they, they have built-in support for OAuth, as in the operating system APIs, yeah? Um, and they say, like, what's your email address and what's your password? And then you say, authorize app. And what comes back to the Twitter application is the token. And from that point on, they can access your data using the token. But Technically, if you believe that this is really the web page from Twitter, you, you never gave them their password. Okay? Let's stop that here. I've also written a sample application that does that, uh, basically, and who is interested in the source code can just shoot me an email. But it, it's doing technically the same thing. It's opening a web container to some authorization server, and then this will show me the login UI. So I say Bob. And then the consent gets shown. Yeah? Win8 client is requesting permission to access a resource on your behalf. That's the resource here. And when you say allow, that's the token coming back to the client. And then I would store the token locally on the device, which is short lived, at least compared to your password. Um, and then you would use the token um, afterwards. So I can now call the service here. And that gives me back some data. And when I close the application and come back to it, you see 
they have the stored token, they don't have to ask me again for authentication. That's the whole idea. Obviously, because you can't bother your users every single time on a mobile device for your password. It just won't work, okay? Okay, so that's the so-called implicit flow. Yeah? Oh, I, I can also quickly show you the uh, um, a sample of the, the, the web flow. Um, that's in here. So when I say start authorization handshake, I go to a server. Yeah, I sign in. I get the content screen, uh, the consent screen, I say allow access. Now the code comes back to the client application and I can say get token and have my token, okay? And then I can also say renew token if the old one is expired. So I get back a fresh one, okay? Good. And then afterwards I can just access, it, uh, access the resource again by putting the token typically on, on the authorization header in HTTP. Okay, last, last flow um, I wanna show is the so-called resource owner password credential flow and that's for so-called trusted applications. And the only difference between that and the flow before that is that there will be no consent screen. So it is assumed that when you're using that flow that you know, um, the user doesn't have to consent to that because the application is already trusted, yeah? And what they're doing is basically, they're doing directly um, a handshake with the authorization server. They say the type is the password, they pass in the name of the, uh, the, the, name of the user, the, the password of the user, of the resource owner, and you get directly back the token and can use that from that point on. So there, there was no user interaction involved here, okay? Okay. Any questions on the flows on, on how this protocol works. Yeah? How long do these tokens normally live? It depends on your authorization server. Very typically it's one hour, but it, it's totally up to the, to the implementa uh, implementer, basically, how, how long these things live, yeah? So what you typically do is you have really short-lived tokens, like maybe even 10 minutes, yeah? And then have refresh tokens to give, get new ones uh, where you have to re-authenticate to get a new refresh token. I mean, the application has to re-authenticate, not the user, yeah? Okay, and I think it's like really... Short question. Yeah? Where, where are the clients that tokens stored? Pardon? Where are the clients that I have to look for, for the tokens? Depends on the operating system. So Windows 8, for example, has, has, a, has DP API, the, the data protection API in Windows built in or they, they even have more higher level APIs called the password vault, for example, where they encrypt the stuff and it's basically stored you know, in application context, somewhere where the application has right access to. Yeah? Whereas uh, other operating systems do it differently. And um, you know, the Windows 8 and, and iOS are more like highly controlled environments because typically you get your stuff from the app store and that ran through certain certifications on Android. You know, it's a little bit of wild, wild west thing, yeah? So, um, yeah, but, but typically it's stored in the context of the application. Some, some operating systems have really good APIs for that, which are not yet broken at least, yeah, <laughs> and some have, don't have that, yeah. Um, okay, yeah? Because you don't see any of the communications in all ways on HTTPS. <laughs> I, I, I'll come to that in a second, yeah. Okay, so the original OAuth logo, you, you can see it, it was an internet thing because it, it, it has a cat, yeah? Um, so the, 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 the original uh, OAuth kitty with the OAuth token, yeah? Um, and that was like the, 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 the roadkill version. Um, a few years later when this guy left the committee and said like, I'm done with OAuth, he made this uh, logo and, and printed t-shirts. Yeah, to, to give out to, to people because he basically said, well, that's what you get. <laughs> so that's another funny thing I saw recently. Yeah? <laughs> so let's start with this guy, Aaron Hammer. That's the guy that, that created OAuth and left the committee just before you know, it was done. And by the way, he, f uh, he, he tweets with the hashtag fuck OAuth. 
Yeah. <laughs> So he's really, really pissed off, yeah, because basically he gave this protocol to the IETF, and he, uh, and in his mind, it was com completely killed by the enterprises. Okay, so he has a number of uh, interesting blog posts, and and the thing is, he's right with everything he's saying, um, but yeah, it's of no big use to you know just um, complain. We have we have to make something out of that, yeah. Um, but he's he's totally right, um, and I'll, I'll go through the, through the points. I guess this, this one is, is the most important one, O of 2O on the road to hell, yeah? um, where he basically says, I'm done with the whole thing. And he made a really good um, uh, talk. He, he gave a good talk on a, on a conf uh, conference in, in the States where he you know, showed all his reasoning behind why he thinks this stuff is broken. So let's have a look uh, at his main points. So the one thing that um, you know, um, really bothered him is, that it became this huge specification. Yeah, it started with a really like a concise piece of paper how to do these handshakes. Yeah, and it was actually called at some point Web Authorization Protocol, and it turned to an authorization framework. Why? Because if you search for the word out of scope in the specification or at the, the discretion of the implementer, then you will see why. Yeah, many many shoulds and mays. If you read specs before, you know what that means. A lot of interpretation yeah, um, space. And as I said, um, in between, there were all the big companies. There were Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Yahoo. They, they were all sitting there and had good ideas how to improve the thing. And then they just left. They're like, OK, we're done. Let Aaron finish the hard work. And as I said, in the end, Microsoft hired a guy to sign off the last, the last revision. So actually, when you're looking at the O of authorization framework family, it's quite interesting. These are the specs you have to read. So this thing was meant to make things easy, as like a counter reaction to WS star, or WS dev star, as many call it. Yeah. Um, so there are the, the core of, uh, proposals, like the, the O of framework, Bearer token usage, the thing that never anyone has read here, um, the FRED model, which is actually a quite interesting document, yeah? And then there are all these satellite specifications around that, yeah? So for example, the token types, yeah? So this thing is about transporting tokens. The tokens weren't specified, yeah? So it, basically, everybody came up with its own token uh, implementation. And we all know that implementing theory tokens is not an easy thing to do. So there is an, another specification called JSON Web Token, which is encryption, signatures algorithm, which is not done yet, by the way. Then there are all these other things they, they basically pushed to later dates, like um, um, SAML2, token revocation, MAC tokens, very important. I'll talk about it in a second. Then there are um, even more esoteric ones, which are still in, in the use, like uh, how do we um, register clients, how do users give consent, uh, chaining of authorization servers, metadata, lots of stuff. And as I said, whoops, uh, OAuth is, is not about authentication, it's about authorization. So if you want to do authentication, there, there's a thing called OpenID Connect, which sits on top of that, and just has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight specs to read in addition. So that is one point where I think we basically can do better. We, we need something like a basic profile that talks about the simple use cases and not you, you may do this and you should do that and, you know, and that's out of scope. <laughs> yeah. um, the next big, big point of criticism here is bearer tokens. So the only token type or token, you know, um, type of token that is specified are so-called bearer tokens. Bearer tokens means that basically you send the token alongside the request. And if someone can steal the token by eavesdropping your connection, he can make his own requests impersonating you. Because there's nothing that binds the token to the request. There's no signature, for example, that you know, um, um, a typical implementation would be to encrypt the token, put a, a session key inside the token, and use that session key to sign the HTTP request. So we, we can't replay this thing anymore. Isn't specified because it, it was too hard. Yeah? So bearer tokens are the only way that is in the spec right now how to transport tokens, okay? Which means, which comes back to the point, our only line of defense is SSL. The only line of defense. So 
how do developers deal with SSL? <laughs> so so I, I asked that question here recently on Google. Yeah? How to handle an SSL validation error? And actually the response I suspected was, well, an answer to that question, right? Well, that came back. Yeah, so the, the main answer developers get on the internet is how to ignore SSL certificate, uh, certificate validation errors. For every popular platform, Java, Apache, .NET, and so on. So in other words, yeah, these guys building these mobile applications which don't have a clue about security, but deal with OAuth and, and kind of protect access to our corporate resources or to other resources, they are basically learning on the internet how to disable SSL validation, meaning you're sitting with your tablet or your laptop in, at the airport or in, in a hotel, and someone simply does a man-in-the-middle attack and you don't realize because SSL validation is turned off for the application. Yeah? And as, as you can see, um, it, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah? In, uh, in iOS, for example, you just have to catch an exception, the SSL validation exception or something, and just swallow it. That's it. Yeah? That's one part of the problem. Yet the other part is this. <laughs> yeah? Mobile carriers these days, they have their own root certificates on the phones, the branded phones, so, so they can decrypt your traffic and can do optimization of it, like caching, uh, uh, um, compression, stuff like that. And that means they first decrypt your stuff run it for their, for their machinery, and then encrypt it again. Um, and that's your bearer tokens, okay? And obviously, you know, that's, that's a bad thing. What else do we have? Huh, security theater. Does anyone know this term, security theater? It was coined by Bruce Schneier. Um, after 9-11, for example, there were like the army uh, patrolling New York City with machine, machine guns with no bullets in it to make you feel secure. Just if, you know, more terrorists would come fall off, fall, fall off the sky or something like that, yeah? And that's the security fear there, yeah? Giving you the feeling of being secure. And Schneier, just yesterday, he, uh, he posted that. Let, let's see if it's still online. That's also security fear there. From, from Wells Fargo, yeah? Um, a, a bank in the States. The last one is the best. It's building secure environment. <laughs> okay? So, so that's security fear. They're giving someone the feeling he is secure where he might not be. So, you know, we talked about these this client applications. Yeah? When they open the dialogues where you see Google's login screen. Strictly speaking, that's security fear though, because no one can tell you that it's really Google what they're showing here, and they're not just retrawn the, uh, the, the, the UI, and you're typing it in, in their application and not in Google's website. Yeah? Um, there were incidents of people that thought like, OAuth is too hard for me. Let's open the Google website and have an, an, an invisible overlay window to capture the keystrokes. Okay? And then they just had passwords and then did their normal thing. Um, many people so say, say like, you know what, um, we could solve that by just showing the browser and not an embedded window, like, like a browser with the address bar and the certificate thing, and I said, yeah, yeah. if you believe that this is actually a browser you're looking at, then the problem is solved for you. You know, anybody can draw something that looks like a browser, yeah? So, in other words, you know, even Microsoft, yeah, putting so much effort, yeah, in their, in their native APIs. Yeah? With, with these secured, secured containers, containers uh, separation, separation, no keystrokes, keystroke, separate, separate cookie containers, containers you know? That, that, that's, that's a good thing, thing. Yeah? For, for the developer. developer. He does the right thing. He doesn't have, have to deal with passwords. But no one is telling you that this is le uh, legitimate. This could be me drawing the Twitter login page. Yeah? So the, the real question is, can we secure client applications at all? Didn't we just make a statement of trust before installing them? Yeah. So yeah, that is what is commonly considered a security theater. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it doesn't help really distinguishing the bad apps between the good apps. 
okay? And obviously the whole app movement helps a little bit because we have to go through the app store and they you know, validate applications, um, at least on iOS and Windows, not, not on Android. Um, and then another interesting thing is, um, <laughs> which went wrong, um, is you know, um, in the implicit flow, you have to, have to give them a callback where the, where the token comes back to your application. Well, do you have to run a web server on the client now to, to get back this HTTP request? No, you register a callback URI when you install the app, or when you submit the application to the store. So Apple has a registered URI for you. Whenever that URI gets invoked, they invoke your application, okay? Now it, it turned out that many people just try to override other applications callback URIs and, and see if, if Apple notices it. Yeah, so basically now when the token comes back, it comes back in your application, not in theirs. And you know, you, you can be sure that, that Apple secures Facebook and Google and so on, but the small apps they don't know about or care about. So it went wrong, historically. <laughs> Android shows, shows a dialogue, there's a conflict. There, there are two apps registered for the same URL. You know, one is, uh, you know, your bank and one shows a smiley. What would you click? <laughs> the happy one, maybe, yeah? Um, so yeah, it's basically, is, again, moving the trust decision to the end user, which or, or, already ran wrong, historically speaking. <coughs> the next thing that went wrong with OAuth is that people use it for authentication. And I pretty much made, made it clear that, that it's an authorization protocol, not an authentication protocol. Mm -hmm. These are totally different things, yeah? So, um, auth authentication is a prerequisite for, uh, for authorization, but it's not the same thing. And what people really wanted is have a sign in with Facebook button in their app. Yeah, so people feel secure, they are basically signing in with Facebook and not you know, giving them the password in the client application. Um, let me quickly, explain to you how that works, authentication with OAuth. So basically, the idea, the idea is this. You go to, to, the, to the client application, you click the sign in with Facebook um, uh, a button, yeah? then, then we go to a Facebook page, you see the Facebook login screen, um, you're feeling good because you're basically doing the right thing. You don't give the application the password, you give it to Facebook where you already have a trust relationship with. And then there's a special endpoint on Facebook called the user info endpoint. That is basically the thing that has information about their first name, last name, email address, this, this profile stuff. So what they are actually requesting a token for is for the user info endpoint. Okay, so basically they're, they're, they're kind of wrapping the authentication thing inside an author, uh, or authorization thing. Okay, so when you click uh, login, they get back a token basically having a user ID and an access token for the user info endpoint. Okay? Now, okay, cool. So the user must be authenticated, right? Because we get back this token. So we can use the user info endpoint, uh, use the token, and get back first name, last name, email, and that stuff. Okay? So, so that's how it's implemented in every single application that's doing Facebook authentication. Where's the problem here? It's on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. The, the user info belongs to Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So from, from there on, uh, the, the client has access to user info. Yes, because yeah. he gets back an access token for user info. Which is a completely different thing than having a, a one-time check of an authentication. Absolutely. Them. So the hack works like this: you sign in into a malicious app. Okay, some app that you know looks legitimate but isn't, and you're doing the right thing, right? You don't give them their password. You're using the Facebook login, so you give it to Facebook. So what do they get back? A full access to your Facebook profile, oh, at least to user info. Yes. Okay, so now they get back a token, yeah, that is for your user info endpoint. So now they take this token and go to a legitimate app and send it along. So basically when you do the, the, the authentication hand, uh, handshake, on the request they substitute their token with your token. What does that mean? You are impersonated. Okay? That's how Facebook login worked since uh, um, 
for a long time. They, they fix that in the meanwhile. Okay? The answer is OAuth is not, not an authentication protocol, full stop. It's an authorization protocol. To do authentication, you, you have to do OpenID Connect, which sits on top of OAuth, which are these eight additional specs you have to read. Okay, so yeah, and that, that's it, by the way, OpenID Connect. My, in, in my mind, the most robust implementation of OpenID and OAuth is, is by Google right now. Um, and you, you see that here? The Google endpoints described here align with the OpenID Connect specification. We just call them OAuth. Yeah, so people don't have to, you know, worry about it. But that, that's a pretty good Im Im implementation. <laughs> there are other recent Facebook hacks, yeah? Um, the road to hell is, is authenticated by Facebook is a good one. Um, hacking Facebook with OAuth and Chrome, or how I fa hacked Facebook again. Um, the whole problems here were that, as I said before, OAuth has a pretty big attack surface. You, you've seen this huge query string with response type, redirect URI, all these things, yeah? So basically, you can manipulate all these parameters and see what happens, yeah? So for example, when you're basically saying, give me back a code, yeah, you, you just hit, hit pause in your proxy and re, uh, remove the code and turn it into token and suddenly a token comes back and, and not a code anymore if the implementation is weak. And you just harvest the token from the browser, okay? Or the redirect URI um, is a, a common attack vector. So um, Google, for example, does an exact match. So when you say, send, send me the token back to this URI, they make sure it's an exact match with the, the, the database record they have for you. And if, if they don't match, they don't, don't give you a token. Facebook just checks the domain name, okay? So you can use facebook.com slash arbitrary things, okay? So what they found is these guys, uh, they found a, a, a Facebook page which, which had a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability. So they sent the token to that page, which in turn sent it back to the client. And they just, you know, um, spammed people with these fake Facebook login links and the token came back to them, okay? So in other words, I guess that brings me to my summary, uh, OAuth itself is not a bad protocol, but there are so many variations and the implementations are very, very bad, we've seen so far, okay? And that is the problem because the big guys started implementing it like halfway through, yeah? So like in, in revision 15 or 32, Google made their first OAuth implementation or Facebook and then they didn't change it for, for, com uh, for com uh, compatibility reasons anymore. In revision 32, maybe they ironed out many of the problems, but that was too late because that stuff was already out there. Yeah? The next big thing is, um, when, you, when you did WS star and SOAP before, you knew that stuff is complicated. But the OAuth spec gives you the feeling, oh, it's just, you know, a post and a redirect, and, and I'm done. Okay? So it's a little bit of, of a do-it-yourself feeling here. Um, people without security background implementing security protocols and that is a recipe for disaster, I guess. Um, and the last things, I guess, is stuff that is missing right now and that is, for one, a more strict profile where there are no shoulds and mays in there, but you must do this, you must do this, you must do this and nothing else, yeah? And the last thing that's missing is a re replacement for, for, for bearer tokens, so we can actually bind access tokens to requests and you know, get rid of the, the problem of eavesdropping and SSL validation errors and infrastructure which decrypts our SSL. And the last um, article I wanna give you is, which, which I think is the best one, written by Tim Bray, by the way, the, the writer of, of the XML specification, um, who works for Google now, and he's the guy that takes care of Google's implementation, and he has a very, very good and balanced and realistic view of what, what works, what doesn't work, and what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and I think that's a, a good read to summarize the whole thing. Questions? Okay, then, yeah? The client was, was, was a browser in, in that case. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Any last words of wisdom or? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>